Are we ready? Is everyone good to go? Yeah. Woo! Great. Ooh, what's up for the second time? Real live people, this is the Nerdy. The Wordy. The book club. My name's Nerdy. And I'm Clarus. And today we are discussing Sam Meg's brand new novel, Battle Scars, mm -hmm. a Star Wars story set between Jedi Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor. All right, who's excited for that game though? Okay, 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 okay. See, internet, there are people here. They made noise. <laughs> there are real life this people is, in the room. This is proof. proof None of, of them it. have ever seen our show before. They're it's all just great. really nice no. British people. You guys are in for a ride. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, we were all in for a ride because yeah. um, uh, people who know us online, uh, mm -hmm. we are very publicly uh, LGBTQ people. We're both mm -hmm. very bisexual. Mm -hmm. And um, th this book was a ride of bisexual proportions. <laughs> Yeah, 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 proportionately uh, bisexual. That's exactly what it was. Uh, <laughs> no, it was great. It was, I don't know what that means either. It was, it was so much fun. It, it's been really incredible to see how much Star Wars has branched out from what it was in the 70s, uh, right? You know, it started. What year? Uh, Come on, you got this. 75. 1977. 77, okay, great. Disappointed. <laughs> That's that's your thing. I uh, numbers not my thing. Uh, <laughs> this is a lot of our show is me like just trying to get under her skin. What? What? Uh, yeah, no. I, I think that what was so fascinating going into this novel was really looking at um, where these characters are in the years after Jedi Fallen Order and mm -hmm. how this novel really sets up Jedi Survivor. I think seeing the first trailer for Jedi Survivor was really interesting because mm -hmm. there are so many elements of that first trailer. Um, yeah, that like are that are related to the book. Yeah, yeah. It, it almost felt like this book was like, were you like confused about Grease's arm in the trailer? Don't worry, it's in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. much like Rise of Skywalker, we've made that joke before. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you can, are you wondering why Seer maybe isn't with the team? It's in the book. Yeah. Do you yeah. think the that this is? Of it. Do you think this is going to be a must read before the book, uh, game comes out? No, I don't think it's going to be a must read. I I think that. Um, I feel like Star Wars is definitely becoming more interconnected, right? A lot of the shows have elements of that show in a different show. You probably know what I'm talking about. Um, but I, the books have always felt a little bit separate. Like, mm -hmm. I've never been a... I, I haven't read a ton of Star Wars books. I read them when I was, like, very, very little. And then more recently, we did last year Brotherhood, and this year we did Battle Scars. I have not read a ton of Star Wars books. And I've never felt lost in the universe. Like, I've never felt like I did not know what was going on. I didn't know where people were coming from. I think that they do a good job of making sure that, like, the visual media um, is all interconnected. And then the books are m more, like, extra flavor. Um, mm -hmm. and, and especially in terms of, like, fleshing out the characters. But I, I don't think this is going to be a must-read. I think that there will be flashbacks. Mm -hmm. Like, we'll get cutscenes, um, And we'll get character explanations for why things are, I think it would be very strange for them to just never talk about why Grease is missing an arm, right? Like, I think people would be like, I don't, okay, but I don't get it though. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it makes me wonder because um, the trailers for Survivor, I don't know, has anyone here seen the trailers for Survivor? Yeah. We're all kind of up to date on that. Mostly. Uh, there's, there's no Inquisitors in any of the trailers so far. We've seen a red lightsaber at one point. Yeah. Um, but it isn't a recognizable Inquisitor from any of the media that I've seen uh, or mm -hmm. read. And so I'm really curious. Th this book seems to set up Fifth Brother as an antagonist to the Mantis crew. Um, yeah. In a way that I don't necessarily think is always effective, uh, just because if you've seen Star Wars Rebels, we all kind of know the Fifth Brother is going to make it through this novel into... You know, he has to be alive eight years from now. Yeah. Um, and he is kind of the only antagonist in the book. So there, there was one element of the novel where I, I had kind of wished, other than Karis or Kiris or however you pronounce the bird man's name. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I was reading it Quaris, but I think it's open. Did to anyone listen to the audiobook? Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what did they say? Uh, they said Karis. Karis. Oh, okay. Oh, and how did I'm they sorry. pronounce um, Fritillawana? Fret. So in the book. Fret, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just go with that. Should we, go, should we get into the plot of the book? Let's go for it. If you're like, guys, get into the book already. This is the first, usually it's a half hour at the beginning of our podcast. We just kind of spew nonsense. Um, the show's usually three hours long, so it's, it's a, a bit different time. structurally. Every time we're like, it's not going to be three hours, and then it ends up being three hours. I don't know how that happens. 
Um, but we yeah. usually go chapter by chapter, but today for Star Wars Celebration, we're going to go section. There's five real sections of this book, right? Mm-hmm. We have our first mission among the Hexian brood, mm-hmm. the um, apparently ugly uh, bounty hunters. I don't know if you know this, but they're very unattractive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very stupid. <laughs> uh, until we get to the extra stupid helmet later on in the novel. Ah, uh, yes, my um, favorite helmet. How did? What did you think about this first mission? Uh, I, it was nice to start off strong with action. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I, I think that um, it didn't, the book did not waste any time, mm-hmm. right? They were like, nah, this is what we're doing. We're getting right into it. Um, they decide they're going to go blow up all, all mercenaries in the Axiom Brood. And I was like, okay, all right, we're, we're just, we're going to blow up the whole thing. But they talk about it a lot through the book that that's kind of what their little group does. They, they go around and uh, create there, chaos. There's a weird line in this book mm-hmm. where they talk a lot about light and dark, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, the theme of this book really is comparing Cal's light side of the force with Marin's dark side. Mm-hmm. And how do those two things interact? And how, how do those two things commingle in this really kind of beautiful friendship that is everyone else except the two of them thinks is romantic, which I'm very curious how that's going to play out in the game. But yeah. there, there's this weird element of they're constantly talking about how Cal is on the light. And they, they kill a lot of people in this novel. They do. They do. Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, here's the thing. Star, that's, that feels very Star Wars to me. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> you know, like it definitely doesn't feel out of place. Um, but it is one of those interesting self-reflective things where I wonder if that will be part of the game. Mm-hmm. The... The, have have the means justified what we have managed to accomplish in the years mm-hmm. um, that we've been on the run? Yeah, there, there's one out. there's one passage later in the book where Sears talking about how she doesn't want to force choke the Inquisitor because that's dark side. Mm-hmm. And I was like, but then like the, the next paragraph is like, and we stood among the carnage of bodies <laughs> in all of the death and destruction we had wrought, just pow, piles of piles. stormtroopers and prisoners piles of that she had released to their death. Yeah, and I'm yeah. Like, I don't know if the choking is as bad as everything else around you, but you seem you, you seem very convinced. Yeah. So. The, the, hey, the Jedi have their ways. They have their lines. And, and you know, Siri's like, as soon as I cross this line, it's, it's nearly impossible to come back from it. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I think it also, uh, it, it matters how they feel <laughs> about the dead people <laughs> as well. You know, it's not... Okay. It... It's it's not totally callous, but callous. Ha 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 ha. Gotcha. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, we 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 murder a bunch of mercenaries, mm-hmm. and then we meet one of our main characters, Fret. We're gonna go with Fret because I do not know how to. Before we get into Fret, say the full name. Yeah. One of the things we want to talk about because I think it's one of the strongest things about Sam X writing in the novel mm-hmm. is the way that she really vividly describes both how Cal connects to the Force mm-hmm. and what, what the experience of using the Force is for him, yeah. the, the, this well that he dives into and is surrounded by, versus the, the really beautiful way from the very beginning of the novel that I feel like she describes Marin's connection to the fire. Yes. And the, the way that that connection grows and, and, and pulses and hurts her, right? Like she has this very violent connection with the Force mm-hmm. uh, in opposition to Cal's very... Um, is soothing, right? Like Cal is often calmed and, and brought into the force in, in a way that is joyful. And honestly, mm-hmm. mind, we, we, uh, the podcast is usually about the Wheel of Time and it was, it was kind of funny. Um, the parallels. In the Wheel of Time, the, the male and the female half of the one power are very different in that women connect um, by surrendering to the power and mm-hmm. men connect by um, wrestling, the, like controlling the power and dominating it. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting that in this book, there was kind of this flip on those genders. Yeah. Um, in, in the way that a lot of gender norms in this book are flipped, I think, right? There's a lot of discussion about um, female characters in very traditionally male-dominant roles. Yeah. And the way that that's handled is really well done. Oh, that's that laptop. Be very careful. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't kick the laptop. Yeah, I, I took a I picture of... <laughs> My, my <laughs> don't, don't do that. I, I took a, a photo of this specific like passage of like Marin's power, especially because I think that is one of Sam Mag's strengths mm-hmm. is how things feel to our characters. Um, she says she felt the visible parts of her dissolve like parchment fed to a fire. For a moment, she burned. It consumed her from the inside out. It was the only time these days that Marin felt truly connected to herself. Every nerve alive 
with the feeling of being seared away into nothingness. She felt everything and then she felt nothing. Mm -hmm. And I, I had to just take a picture of that one because I, it, it, was, it was such an impactful little, not even paragraph, but a couple sentences. And I was like, oh, I, I, I understand how this character feels in connection to this, this thing that is uh, otherworldly. Like I, I, I don't have a modern day comparison to feeling the force or magic or whatever it might be, right? Um, and so having it described in such vivid detail, uh, I think was one of the strengths of Sam Eggs in, in this book. And it sets up the the core kind of uh, issue that Marin's going through in this book, other than her love life, which is a disaster. Um, yeah. <laughs> poor girl. Yeah. But she, you know this this idea that, and it, it says it explicitly in the book: what is a night sister of Dathomir without either Dathomir or sisters, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that there's a point in everybody's life where you kind of go through that. I remember when I I moved away for college. Um, and I moved to New York to study musical theater. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the cultural shock from moving from Midwestern Canada and, and working on a farm to moving to the Big Apple and suddenly surrounded by uh, all kinds of people that I had never met before, all kinds of cultures I'd never experienced. Mm -hmm. And also not having anyone around me that understood my culture, right? That in every situation I was bringing something into the room that was a little bit foreign to everybody else. And going through that experience and, and, and that shaping moment of realizing, like, I have to find a way to be comfortable with the fact that who I am is something I carry with me and mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily need to be reflected in all of the people around me, mm -hmm. right? I, I need to find a way to walk into the room and, and not always have to try and be like everybody else, not always try and have to fit in and, like, give up parts of myself mm -hmm. in order to be with a family. And there's a really beautiful element of this novel where Marin is so concerned about the judgment that she's going to face for being herself with this group that mm -hmm. the the element of um cal's lightness will eventually turn on her will it will eventually turn away from her mm -hmm. and that doesn't happen right and, and she worries that fret this character that we meet this stormtrooper who's really just really hot, really hot right? she's so mm -hmm. purple and yeah. she's so hot uh <laughs> and she's never wearing a shirt <laughs> yeah, that's so true. So that won't be in the game because. <laughs> um, no, probably not. I don't think Fret is going to be in the game. I don't think that is a storyline. You don't line. think? No, I don't. I don't think so. I would agree with you, except for the very explicit we added a calm thing to the hollow table so you can call us anytime. Mm, okay, maybe. Right? It, feel, yeah, it, I don't it know. feels set up for Ire? I had to pronounce the other book. Irie at uh, Erie. Erie? Erie. 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 Okay. Sure. Yeah. Let's go yeah. with Erie. <laughs> Erie, Pennsylvania. Great town. Uh, there's a hot dog place downtown. Um, yeah. That's great. <laughs> I was there for one night. I played there one night with Elf. Yeah. <laughs> I was there for a year. You lived in Erie, Pennsylvania? Oh, wow. Wow. What a small world. That's <laughs> Well, all right, Talking so um, I think place. that Fred and Erie will come back, but uh, who's Erie? Good question. Let's get into it. <laughs> we uh, meet Fred, well. the super hot stormtrooper. Yeah. Um, we choke Fred really quickly. Yeah. There's some hands on throat action. Yeah. Marin is, uh, Marin gets a little spicy. They get mm -hmm. a little spicy. Uh, they esce from the, well, the Haxian brood. Um, but but uh, only there's... because. Fret throws Seer yeah. up into the spaceship. Yeah, they, they almost don't make it. Um, and they aren't going to make it, uh, except that Fret literally throws her up in the air. Uh, I mean, which the woman I like, has the force. I feel like she doesn't need the help. N uh, no. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Seriously? Who knows? She wasn't going to make it. Nice. Maybe she already used the force, and the force like tapped out, and Fret's like, nah, I got this, you know? Eh. Or it's like, nah, not, not today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stormtroopers at this base. Yeah. A, a, lot of, a lot of troopers, which is a little suspicious. Um, but makes sense. Like, they're everywhere. The, they're like the plague. Empire, man. Yeah, literally everywhere. Not a good time, you know? The bad Empire? times, bad vibes. What? No. Yeah, I get bad vibes from the Empire. I don't know. I feel bad. like it's going to no. play out, it, how it's going to play out, but I get bad, bad vibes. Bad? No, no, I don't think so. I think you're, I think you're overreacting. Uh, <laughs> uh, but th this action, this, this moment of uh, toss, 
you know, like Aragorn tosses Gimli across uh, to the bridge of oh, Helm's Deep. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. This is a great reference. We, we, we get this toss that brings Fret into the crew mm -hmm. and uh, sets our team on a new mission uh, that basically destroys them. <laughs> It kind of like rips them apart and brings them back together in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. So Fret has a plan. Uh, she has a birdman who knows about a device called the shroud mm -hmm. uh, that has not yet been built, but could be built. Could if be they built. get the schematics that are being held in a prison, which is a totally normal place for schematics to be held. That's totally, it totally makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and all they have to do is go steal them, but only, only after uh, Marin and Fret uh, get all googly-eyed with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very googly-eyed. And then bone down on Cal's bed. Yeah, yeah. That was a little bit inconsiderate, you know? If you're gonna, if you're gonna do it, just use your own bed. It's there for a reason. Everyone's got their own space on the ship. But no, they, they decide to lock themselves uh, in, in the engine room. And, and Cal is like, oh, Marin's fire around the door is looking real strong. I'm, I'm real happy for her. For hours. Like, <laughs> Yeah, hmm, I wonder what they could be up to. Cal is, <clears throat> Cal must be protected at all costs. Like, he's so <laughs> sweet and naive. <laughs> yes. But it really was a perfect, like, image of, um, like, it, it reminded me a lot of Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender, in that, like, what would, what would he know about sex? He grew up with either other bald boys his age or, like, 95-year-old men on top of a mountain. <laughs> Katara might be the first woman he's ever met in his entire life. Quite possibly. And, and this is a similar scenario, right? Like, Cal is like, oh, yeah, romance is a thing other people do, but nah, yes. it couldn't be me. Yeah, and other There's people... There's no way they're having sex on my bed, right? No, <laughs> couldn't be. They are. <clears throat> yep. For hours. Yeah, very long time. A kind of indiscriminate amount of time, but uh, they, it's fine. It, it's funny because it, it is... And I'm so sorry, Lucasfilm. I know you were like, keep it PG-13, but this is what the this is literally what the book is about. They are having sex in his room the first time mm -hmm. for longer than they've known each other before they begin. That's kind of what it sounds like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I mean, hey, like if your stamina is that good, all the power to you, but that sounds exhausting. There's gotta, there's gotta be like a water bottle back there or something, right? Like, yeah. Like a Gatorade. Cal you know? probably stays hydrated. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the engine room. It's so hot. I just can't imagine a worse place. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like if you're, time, you're a night sister of Dathomir, maybe you don't like sweat the same way. True. Like, you know, you know, oh, the, the yeah. heat from the engine doesn't affect you in the same way. I yeah. think that's possible. I'm ex I'm excited for the like I, I feel like there's so much potential here for great, hilarious music video parodies on YouTube of this scene. Of like just mm -hmm. give me the like song from Ghost and then like Marin's like green like fire hands instead of Patrick with the, Swayze. Po with the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. pottery? But they're like fixing, they're, they were actually fixing the engine the whole time. Yeah, 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 yeah. The implication is that That's, it was steamy, but it actually wasn't. No, they were, no. They, were, yeah. they were just fixing the engine. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Things get a little spicy. They, uh... Did you, okay, here's a question I had for you. This is yeah. also where we learned for the first time that Seer is this brilliant technician. Uh, and she's the one that fixes BD-1 from the little bumps and scrapes he takes in this first mission. Did you get from the first game that Seer was the technician of the group? Well, she's the one who, like, hacks into the comms and stuff. She does, she does oh, yeah, the when tech she, stuff. Oh, yeah, because Trillo learned how to hack comms from her. Yeah, yeah. So it, it makes sense. I definitely don't think it's, like, uh, like explicit, like, f front and center in the mm -hmm. game. Um, but I think it's definitely implied. So it did not come as a surprise to me. I was like, yeah, 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 that, that makes total sense. And especially how they run missions, mm -hmm. you know, Grease and Seer are kind of like the team who are working the, um, uh, fr from above. Uh, well, like Marion is the sneaky one because she can literally be invisible, which is really cool. Jealous. Um, and it is, it is very <laughs> Cal just goes me. and blasts him. But, but there, there's a very explicit thing where Cal always comes from beneath. And Marin is always on top, which I thought was very funny because with Fret, she's definitely a bottom. Yeah. Like, there's no way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That is definitely the implication. She, she does not give top energy at all. No, no. Which is weird. Like, as a character, I, that's, that's the vibe that I got from her. But this whole interaction with Fret, yeah, she definitely does not feel like the top. She might just be a switch. Uh, a know? few hours later, um, when things have happened, they, they fix the engine. It's in yeah. great working order. Yeah, uh, engine is working great. Uh, uh, they, they have a meeting at the hollow table. They're going to go meet Karis for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and Fret walks in shirtless. 
Uh, yeah. And doesn't doesn't think to put a shirt on. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, the the, uh, the I'm sorry. I, when there were two kids in here, I was kind of like. I feel like you guys didn't read the book. This book I don't is spicy. know that this is necessarily appropriate for like a 10 year old child. <laughs> yeah, just so you know, this is And I tried spicy. to warn them. You I did. tried to be like, look, guys, we're going to be talking about. You know what? You did. You did. I, I, think, I think you did everything. I don't know you how you know. It's like 30% of this book is basically I know. Like two women thirsting over each other harder than I've ever experienced. And I, I experienced Tumblr in 2008. Okay? Yeah. Like, I remember we were there for that, you know? It's... I survived the Tumblr girly era. <laughs> I'm proud of you. <laughs> I was uh, very young and trying to figure myself out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so we meet uh, we meet uh, Karis, uh, fancy fancy man. Um, yeah, you were mentioning how um, Brett walked in shirtless. Mm -hmm. Am I correct in saying that the Marin walked in with the shirt that Brett was wearing before? The, I, I think so. Yeah, think that, that was, she then keeps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was concerned about that because Cal doesn't pick up on what's going on at that point. And no I was idea, like, dude. Not a clue. Like. <laughs> So oblivious, and, and I was like, "Bless your heart." He's even like using the force yeah. to be like, "There's, there's something going on here." So weird connection that these these two have. Am I, am I anyone else feeling this? No. If you've ever seen Shrek the musical, Donkey has this great song in Act Two where he's uh -huh. insinuating that Shrek and Fiona are falling in love. Uh -huh. It's hilarious. The so three blind mice show up. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, production number. But uh, I, I wanted Cal to have a bit more of that energy here because. The, the dude's job is investigative, like, spycraft. <clears throat> wow. And I was a little bit like, Cal, I feel like you're, you're, you're betraying that you're maybe not the best person for this job in particular <laughs> if this, if you can't pick up on this specific thing. He's, he's not good at the interpersonal lovey-dovey stuff, right? Like, he doesn't. Yeah. He's got a great relationship with this droid. He, he does. And actually, like, that was one of my favorite parts of the book is just him, the how he talks to BD. Yeah. Um, I also love that it's spelled out like B D one. Only when of, they like, say it. Well, only when they say yeah. it out loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that that was actually. That's been a thing in Star Wars books for a long time. Yeah. Um, it wasn't so much a thing in um, Brotherhood. It wasn't a thing I noticed as much, just because I don't think there were. When Anakin, uh, yeah, when Anakin talks many. to R two, it's always spelled out as R T O O. That's true. A R T O O. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that that's true. Yeah, I just, I loved it. It, like, brought me joy. One of my favorite parts of the game is the Cal Kestis BD1 relationship. Like, I, I, I love BD1 so much. <laughs> I did not get one for my cosplay, and I'm a little bit sad about it, but I, I'll work on that for next time, so. It's funny, because we have one in our house. Yes, but it's Lego. That <laughs> I got you for your birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you still haven't built. You know what? I'm going to build it when the game comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it'll be fun. It's fine. It's only eight months after your birthday. Yeah, um, it's fine. We're not. We're, we're busy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did appreciate them because I've always, you know, BD1 always connects to Cal in the game and you're like, how does that work? And, and I like the book being like, it hurts. Cal's like, you know what? <laughs> it's kind of painful, but yeah. I put up with it because why not? Yeah. It's cute. I also just love that BD's there like the whole time just like yeah, poking yeah. him in the back of the shoulder. So like, I don't know if I would hate that or not, but like I think BD1 is so cute that I'd be okay with it. Of and course, it, you would love it. You're, you love cats. And that's, that's all cats do. <laughs> that's cats true. Cats are just little goblins that ruin your things. <laughs> that's slander, okay? Cats are wonderful. Um, but I do love that Marin actually talks about how BD1 is so adorable that she wants to crush him. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that feels, that, that feels very modern. I feel like, this might be weird, but I feel like I always hear women talk about that when they meet their friend's kids. For like little babies, I always hear like a grown women be like, oh my God, I could just smother him. And I'm like, that's a weird thing to say to like a <laughs> three month old, you know? Yeah, no, it's more just like you just, you, 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 I don't know, you want to aggressively cuddle them, I guess. <laughs> sure. Uh, so we meet Karis. Karis is a bird. Um, mm -hmm. Karis needs a jetpack. He's a terrible bird. Uh, True. Most birds can fly. I, I must, I, this made me think that he's like ostrichy. And I, I kind of want him to just have a real long neck. But they talk about him having hollow bones. Because he's a bird. Well, yeah. So you would think he would fly. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but he needs a jetpack. He, he sends him on this mission. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's a big bad time because the Inquisitors, don't know if you know them, uh, they're on the way. They also want the shroud because it... It basically makes know. you undetectable. 
I guess. It, it makes you invisible and also non-existent and also radar free and also. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's, it's magic. Yeah, um, but it doesn't exist in Star Wars later, so don't worry. The book will deal with that very quickly yes. at the end. Yes. Uh, and we go to what is the the centerpiece of this book, right? I, I think our, the best scene in this book, mm -hmm. um, and uh, where I the, the definitely the piece of the book where I couldn't put this down the the mission to this prison break. Yeah. Um, it starts with Fret basically being like, "Hey, I've got codes to this prison. I've definitely left the Empire. Don't worry about it. Not still a member." But I've got codes. I can get us in scot-free. It's going to be super easy, barely uh -huh. an inconvenience. Uh -huh. And uh, everyone just kind of accepts that. They're like, yeah, okay, cool. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. Except Grease is kind of like, what, what, do we do we need this? Do thing? we have to? Is this smart? And I, I want to really commend Sam Meggs here because one of the tough things I think about writing a book like this is how you age up the characters who have aged. Uh, but also really like write them like they are still the characters from the game mm. while also not aging up characters like Grease and Marin. And I think that, or uh, Grease and uh, Seer, sorry. Mm. I think that there's an element of writing characters as they get older, where if you're going to do a time jump, older characters tend to not change as much, right? If you're 45 and you turn 50, you're going to have less of a huge, uh, and obviously like there's exceptions. tragic, you know, or, or huge life changes aside. A lot of people are pretty consistent once you hit a certain age. Mm -hmm. um, and Grease and Seer, to me, felt so consistent from their game counterparts yep, throughout 100%. this whole novel. Yep. And Marin and Cal didn't. Marin and Cal felt different to me. They felt older. Mm -hmm. And I think it was really impressive of Sam to blend these characters who just don't have as much reason to change, who we met already kind of on the mission that they're on in this, mm -hmm. while also showing, uh, Marin obviously has the biggest change because her whole life is turned upside down yeah. by meeting the Mantis, by joining the Mantis and leaving her home for the first time. Yep. Um, and when we got to Grease, that Grease was so grounding for me in this novel because he felt so much like that video game counterpart. Yeah. And, and that was where I, I felt like I could really like breathe in the world of the game again in these characters years later mm -hmm. because he was just written so well. And being able to write in multiple perspectives, have them all feel like different people mm -hmm. and, and, and be able to understand where every single one of them is coming from, I thought was absolutely fascinating, very well done because it, it becomes a key part of the book in the end mm -hmm. that they're not on the same page, yeah. right? They're not all coming at this from the same place. And it ends up being a huge problem for them because they're not working as a team. They don't have the same goals. Yeah. Um, and this is the first yeah. time that's brought up. Grease brings this argument to the table and it starts to splinter the group a little bit. They, they all have this argument about how they're going to move forward. Mm -hmm. And they all have really valid points of view, which I appreciated. It didn't feel like any of them were bringing sort of the... In t television writing, they call it the stupid ball, where for the plot to move forward, one of the characters is going to hold the stupid ball for a scene just so that, you know, things can kind of happen. Yeah. Um, but I, I felt in, in all three of the big argumentative blowups between the crew, everyone brought a really tangible point of view to it. Yes. Uh, and this is the first of those. And it kind of caused everyone to walk away a little bit angry. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone sits down, does their own thing. And Seer and Cal have this beautiful moment that I, I want to talk about because I thought it was really important and gets into the conversation that we were talking about a little bit earlier about is murder dark side? How, how did, how did the Jedi view this tenant, this code that they live with? Yeah. And um, they're sitting and they have this conversation and Cal says, uh, he, they're talking about attachments and he says, I, I know that it's usually meant in a romantic context, but when you say that we here, everyone on board the ship, we've all formed connections. And, um, there, I'm going to skip a bit, but he says, how does that not open us up to the dark side of the force? And Seer just replies with, I don't know, right? Mm. And I thought that this, um, this was such an important moment in the book. And I think one of those conversations that's so important in Star Wars is that there is this ongoing discussion of the Jedi and how they keep to the light despite this attachment issue, right? How do you let go and not use the dark side, which Sira is so tempted to do throughout this book, right? Mm -hmm. There are mm -hmm. opportunities where she could just end the fight by leaning into that power. Yeah. Um, but but why is Anakin's relationship with Obi-Wan any different than his relationship with Padme, right? Mm -hmm. Why is brotherhood or sisterhood, or why, why is it romantic is the thing that we harp on. And I, I was so glad this book brought this to, into the Star Wars discussion. Yeah. Because I think it's an important one to have. I, I think that there are so many forms of love that you can show to someone else, right? Yeah. And 
I, 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 yeah, I, I want to know what you think about it. Well, it's been interesting watching, I'm currently watching The Clone Wars for the first time. Um, I was always a huge fan of all the movies, like that was my jam, and I don't know, when I was in, whenever Clone Wars was coming out, I was like, oh, that's a kid's show, you know, I'm not gonna, mm -hmm. I, I don't need to worry about that. Um, and so I'm, I'm catching up, currently watching Clone Wars, and there is an arc where Obi-Wan fakes his death and Anakin is like, is, is ruined by it. And, and you see the beginnings of Anakin's dark side throughout a lot of Clone Wars. Mm -hmm. Like that is, that is very much foreshadowed. You're like, yeah, there's no way that this guy's gonna <laughs> make it through unscathed. Um, but I don't think it is that different. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, I think that the impact and the outcome can have slightly different variations mm -hmm. for sure. But I do not think that Anakin's relationship with Obi-Wan is that much different from his relationship with Padme. He is very protective of both of them and Ahsoka. Yeah. Uh, you know, at, at that point, even Ahsoka, Ahsoka, uh, spoilers for Clone Wars, I guess, uh, dies for a moment on this like God planet. And I mean, like there, there, this whole arc I had me like scratching my head. I was like, the hell's going on? Ahsoka is dead for a moment and is brought back to life by another character's sacrifice. Um, and in those moments... <laughs> that happens. It, I was like, what is going on right now? Um, that was a very D&D &D moment of them. Yes, the, yeah, the resurrection spell. The, the, thank God for that. Because uh, I don't know, I don't know what Anakin would have done if Ahsoka had like actually died in that moment. I think it would have... I escalated that downward spiral mm -hmm. that he goes down um, at the end of uh, Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> it's like trying to get all the names straight in my head. Um, and so I don't, I don't think it's that different. And I think that that's why Seer doesn't know what to say mm -hmm. to Cal in that moment. Because how can you go through life completely alone? You, you can't. Yeah. That, I think, is a, is a different path to the dark side. Um, for, for, for certain people, yeah. right? That loneliness and that having no connections to people means that you have a really hard time relating to people. Mm -hmm. And that, that empathy is hard to develop. Um, and so I, I think that... Can I jump in for a second? Yeah, yeah, That's so interesting it. because... It, it, I, I love that you said that because what's so fascinating to me is that Marin, mm -hmm. Marin's connection to the dark side, she struggles with it when she's alone. Right? Her loneliness is, is... Her sisters all die. Yeah. And she, like, ha she has the Mantis crew. Mm -hmm. You know, she has those relationships in her life, which is great. And I think it's why she's able to maintain some connection. But yeah, as soon as she is cut off from her, like, from her, her entire civilization, her magic starts to dwindle. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think, I, I do think that Seer doesn't know what to say in this moment because there's, there's A, there's no right answer. Mm -hmm. And and B, I don't know if Seer wants to admit that uh, that there isn't a difference. <laughs> I also think Seer is unique in the Jedi that we've seen go to the dark side because she's the only character who, like, we know the moment she went to the dark side, uh, other than Anakin. And Anakin's is so built on this romantic connection to Padme, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. these visions and what's going on with him. Whereas Seer, Seer is in a moment of connection with Trilla, right? Mm -hmm. That isn't. I, I would argue it's not romantic. I don't ever feel like no, that's implied. Just and so, Padawan. you know, for her, I feel like this is an extra pointed question for her because her fall is specifically related to... It's due, due to a relationship that, yeah. yeah, I agree, is not romantic. And she still touches the dark side of the Force. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, she's like, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. And that's hard when you are, you know, the last of your order, you don't have anyone you can ask. And you are the last master, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like being the only, like, it's like being the adult in the room and not realizing that you're, like, the adult. You're like, ah, yeah, I got to ask somebody about adulting. And then you're like, oh, no, shit, I'm the adult in the room. I've okay. never experienced that. No? I'm no. never the adult in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, moving out, it was like, oh, no, wait a second. I am an adult. Weird. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so uh, Seer, uh, being the very capable tracker that she is, Mm -hmm. uh, she and Fret devise a plan for them to break into this building. Mm -hmm. And we get a series of betrayals uh, from Fret back to back to back. Yeah. Just uh, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Poor, uh, poor Marin. Poor, like, this is the... Th this book starts with Cal being like, this is going to be a great day. And it is a series of terrible days for everybody involved. Well. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Uh, so they break into the... Pa they break into the, um, the prison, prison. Where the thing is being held. 
Is it Marcana? What's it's not called? a thing. We'll get I'm not like being <laughs> mean about the Nikto, but uh, we break in and immediately over the comms are like, no, you guys shouldn't have been able to do that. But yeah. So he was like, this is suspicious. And, and Fred is like, so actually. Um, well, no, I Marin think- goes, no, 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 <laughs> yeah. let her cook here. And I was yeah. like, oh, Marin, what, what did you do? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Fred has not left the Empire. Fred is still part of the Empire because she knew that the codes change, was it every like half hour or something like that? Can, can I be honest? There was an element of this where I was like, why does this matter? Why does what matter? Whether or not the Empire still thinks she's a member of the Empire. Because like, she has to have the right codes to get them through the building. I know, but it's not like she's going to like put in two weeks notice. Like once she is actively trying to get out, she's... As far as the Empire is concerned, she's out. This, th- there was sure, a little bit of this storyline where they were like, what, you're not, you haven't actually left yet? And I was like, w- she's not going to quit. Like, she's not going to like <laughs> she go to her boss and be like, letter. I'm done, I'm leaving, but like I'm doing it secretly, but I'm telling you, like. Yeah, it, honestly, in, in a way, like Fret seems, obviously Fret like lying uh, puts the whole team off, but, but where she's coming from and why she lies, I do completely understand. Right. Uh, she has to have the codes. And as soon as she like disappears, the Empire will be looking for her. And she says, oh, you know, I'm, I'm they, they think I'm on a mission. Mm-hmm. I have like another month before I have to check in, which is fine. You know, she's planned for this. But but just in case of anything, her not severing that connection immediately actually does make a lot of logical sense, which I think is why Marion is like, OK, OK, but like let her talk for a second. Yeah, I, I think that my confusion was just that. If I met a stormtrooper and Mm -hmm. they're like, I want out. And I was like, cool, let's go. And she was like, I mean, like technically, like I'm still wearing stormtrooper armor. Like technically I'm still a member because I haven't told them. I wouldn't be like, you lied to me. You said you were done with them forever. I'd be like, yeah, no, that makes sense. You're not going to tell them you're leaving. You're just going to flee. I think it's only a problem. We have a hand up. (laughs) But isn't it, isn't it at the same time, I may be missing something, Mm -hmm. but um, if she says, I want to leave, I'm gone. She must have had a plan in her head, like, oh, we were going after the Shroud. Like, I knew I needed these codes before they even got to Karis and talked about it. Yes. Yeah, and, and she does She does explicitly say, I have left the Empire. And, and so I think if she had maybe just been a little more vague about that, it wouldn't have mattered so much. Um, I just, I felt like Cal was a little bit, like, overly... I, I, the, the, the next betrayal feels more like a betrayal, right? Lying about what the Shroud is and her connection to it. I, I think uh, we should bring up Cal has um, psychometrized, that's the word, uh, yeah. the Stormtrooper armor. So Cal has seen a Ray's face, even though we don't, Eerie's face, even though we don't know what that is yet, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there was, just, there was just an element of this where I was like, I, I don't know that I would be that mad that she's still technically a member I think it's more because it's in the moment of things, yeah. right? If, if you're going into a high stakes situation, knew. I, I think that's Marin part of knew. Why, yeah. yeah, going into a high stakes situation, just just being totally upfront and honest, which Cal mentioned several times. You know, you shouldn't have kept this for me, or mm-hmm. like we should have been more open about all of these things. And I, I think that that's actually a key theme of this book is just being honest with the people that you have relationship with, and communication um, is so important. Um, yeah, yeah, they they get to the well, prison. they split up. And uh, yeah. they they kill a bunch of people. Yeah, and yep. Marin, um, that that gets it going, and so they they start making out in the hallway. They uh, do on start on top of the bodies of the people they just killed. Yeah, they and just... then Cal runs into them while they're making out, and, does and still not does not realize notice at all. Oh God, Cal, you sweet <laughs> summer child. Um, yeah, that was my favorite <laughs> moment. I was like, oh yeah, he's gonna run into this. It's gonna be super awkward. Not does not even notice. It's like, okay, I, I yeah, I guess he's concentrating on other things, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, he's been chased. So like, yes. to be fair, there are people after him. Yes. Um, but uh, yes, and it they... was interesting timing. There's a lot of interesting yeah. timing in the romance in this book. <laughs> that's what's fun. that's why it's fun. Oh, um, 100%, yeah. Yeah, they find Eerie, who is the schematics, because there are no schematics. They live in her brain. Yeah, a lovely, uh, tall Nikto. Uh-huh. Um, uh, a species I, I wouldn't traditionally describe as beautiful. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not big into scales. <laughs> That's a weird one for yeah. me. I, I like, like, like a lizard folk. I like skin, weirdly. <laughs> um, yeah, so weird. Uh, but we find out that she, no, she, she memorized the schematics. For the thing. Because she made it. She came up with it. Sort of, yeah. 
Uh, and I mean, she came up with uh, it hypothetically, even though it actually doesn't work. Yeah, and so they're like, well, we'll get you out. Uh, the plan is uh, prison break, but the, f- the Inquisitors are here now. And so uh, well, naturally, they get out, no problems. Everything's fine. No yeah, end of the book. No, no big deal. Uh, <laughs> no, no, we get to fight. We fight an Inquisitor. Things go wrong because Fret and Eerie take off, right? Yeah. Fret has this moment where she's like, oh, my God, my dead girlfriend is alive again. Uh, We've which, all been there. Yeah, totally relatable moment. Um, It's like a Tuesday. Crazy how that happens. Uh, Yeah, so it's obviously very impactful for Fred and very impactful for Marion watching (laughs) Fred be impacted by this moment. Because she's like, oh, no, 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 something's something's going on here. And it's also impactful for Cal, who's watching Marion be impacted by Fred's reaction to this moment as well. So it's like a a whole circle. It's it's great. Um, But, you know, they're not going to leave her there. They're they're not going to be, well... They're kind of dicks about it. It's a complicated situation. But they're going to take her with them. She and wants to die. Like, she, it, it, she doesn't say it explicitly, but she's like, no, it, it might be better. Like, I, I don't think I should leave with anybody. And I was like, that's, that's, that's dark. Yeah. Yeah, no, they go there. And if, if that's the cost of the Empire not having this, like, specific technology, like, I can understand her thinking that that's the only sacrifice mm-hmm. that she can make, right? But, if, but, you, if you only have that option, if there's only one thing within your power... You know, having that having that choice is really important to people. I, I love this moment for Cal, though, right? Because you get this moment where she is just so in the weeds. She's like, I don't think I can come with you. I don't want to go with them. And, and you feel that darkness coming from her. And in that moment, Marin acknowledges, like, Cal is the most empathetic MFer in the world. And through just sheer charisma, in a very short amount of time, he's able to convince her that they can keep her safe. Yep. And I think that... For, for a book that um, at times really drifts to be more about Marin than Cal, I think this was one of those beats where Cal got a really great moment to mm-hmm. show his value and, and what the Jedi bring, right? Yeah. The, the light of the Jedi. Um, it's a good name for a book. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it means something in this galaxy still. And, and Seer mm-hmm. is so concerned this whole novel about what, what is the legacy of the Jedi if they're gone? Yeah. What was the point? We, we protected the galaxy for 10,000 years, and that's just disappeared overnight. And I, I think that this is one of the scenes in the book where you get to see what the power of the Jedi still are, right? Mm-hmm. It's this moment where this woman is literally saying, like, it might be better if I'm dead. And the Jedi in the room is going, no, come on. I got this. I got this. Trust me. I got you. We're good. Because mm-hmm. I, I, if, if Cal isn't in the room for that scene... I Marin think it goes can't do differently. That. No, 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 no. You know what I mean? Fret is definitely Fret's traumatizing. <laughs> like, I'm amazed Fret got any words out. I God, if any of my I don't have any dead ex girlfriends, thankfully. But if <laughs> if that were to happen, like I, I would be so speech. I would be beyond yeah. speechless. Yeah. What? What? You know that uh, that incredible like reaction in that moment is very real, very human, and mm-hmm. like maybe not like relatable, but you can empathize with it, right? <laughs> Yeah, and this, I just, I love that they gave this moment to Cal in particular. Mm-hmm. And um, the, we get, uh, we do get them to safety a little bit, but Fred and Irie do leave for a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. They can't be there for the Inquisitor fight, so they run off on their own. Uh, that is, that's arguably the worst betrayal of this, right? At the end of this mission, you put everyone at risk, and, and they, they turn around and they're just gone. They leave, yep. Yeah. Uh, and the fifth brother walks in. And With the stupidest hat you've ever seen, just in case you hat. didn't know. Uh, that that was one of my favorite parts of this book. It's just the stupid hat and the dumb poncho. Hey, the pink poncho. <laughs> Cal really <laughs> wanted to bring awareness of breast cancer. All right, and he it was is trying to. The damnedest. perfect color for yeah. that. Yes. I, uh, I I've always I've always loved the fifth brother's helmet because I assumed that he had like a head that needed it, but learning that he doesn't was. Make, makes the helmet weird. I like just thought it was a weird changed. alien species that had like, I don't know, big ears or something. <laughs> no, But at no, least it's, it's lightsaber just... proof. It is. It's a lightsaber proof helmet. And honestly, I get that. It's functional. Yeah. It, it doesn't need to be fashion. Does if that it's mean it's Uh, maybe. How many lightsaber resistant uh, alloys are there in the universe? Oh my God. I think it might be best. Dude might have a Beskar helmet. I Maybe. He's like half Mandalorian at this point. <laughs> just got to put the Mythosaur on there. Um, yeah, I honestly didn't think about that. I just figured that there were other things that were lightsaber resistant, but mm-hmm. I, I can't think of any others. So maybe and it is. So the fifth brother wrecks shop. 
Like this is it's it's pretty brutal. Uh, yeah. The this scene was it, it's I like a lot of the action books so fun to read, but um th this one was a little bit hard to read too. Like it, it was, was fun, but also I was kind of like, oh my god. <laughs> they, yeah. I know Cal's in the next game, but is he gonna die here? <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> Th this that, is actually set do? after Jedi Survivor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh secretly. my god. Um, uh, surprise. They, they fight off some purge troopers and Cal, they, they get to this final moment where the Inquisitor walks in and he mm -hmm. says, you gotta go. Protect Grease, protect Seer. I got this. You gotta go. Mm -hmm. And Marin leaves, reluctantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully, uh, Seer's like, no, no. We're not, we're not leaving him to die. We're not doing that. And she comes back, joins the fight, uh -huh. and Cal gets... Force thrown through cement in the ceiling of the building. Yep. Yeah, it gets spicy. It gets bad. Uh, and that's where we find out where the helmet is lightsaber resistant because Seer literally like what falls on his head. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> I just want that image. Seer, I, I I really loved the imagery here of Seer analyzing the fifth brother's movement mm -hmm. and, and how it worked and how how rough he was. But also that despite the fact that she saw the advantage in his rough, shoddy kind of um, brute force strategy, yeah. she still couldn't quite overcome it fully. She could a little bit, um, but the only way that she could overcome it fully was to kill him. And we get... She uses his own technique against him, but like better. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little more control, a little more finesse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, Seer makes this very, I think, controversial decision to try and save him. Because they, they, they kind yeah. of save Trilla, right, for, for a moment. You know, granted, redemption in Star Wars is always a little bit easy, right? Vader well, killed a lot of but people. But they usually die afterwards. So yeah, I don't the, know about easy. <laughs> the, 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 the redemptions are always like, they're redeemed, and then they died, so they didn't have to prove it. Well, yeah, I guess that's one way of looking at it. Well, I, I feel like, you know, it, it's just, it, it's, it's funny that it happened twice, right? Yeah, yeah. If I had a yeah. nickel. Yeah, yeah you have two exactly. nickels. Uh, and so Seer, Seer overcomes him and builds a cage of metal and traps him against the wall. Mm -hmm. But we cut to Grease. And Grease, um, uh, Grease back on the ship. And Fret runs up with Eerie. And uh, Eerie yeah. is very hurt because very Fret can only block so many blaster bolts with her own body. Which is pretty badass. Sure, yeah. But oh, like horrifying image. And so she's pulled onto the ship and Marion is there. And Marin has to use the like last vestiges of her magic mm -hmm. to save Eerie. Um, and so they, you know, they go back into the engine room uh, and they stay there for a while. Uh, All the places. And, and Grease, Grease takes it upon himself um, to go find the rest of the crew. And he... Uh, I feel like at this point, Cal and Marin should just switch bunks. Should just switch bunks? Yeah, probably. You know, it's probably for the best. There's been a lot of weird shit going in his bedroom lately. Yeah, they just, they should probably, yeah, just do a swap. It's probably better for everyone. Uh, but Grease shows up and Seer is trying Grease to Grease gets his convince... guns and he starts blasting. Yeah, literally. And he tries to, he walks in <laughs> on Seer trying to convince the fifth brother mm -hmm. uh, that, <laughs> that, that the brainwashing that he has undergone um, is, well, that it's brainwashing. Like it, she, she tries to bring him to the light. Mm -hmm. she, and she tries, she, she tries real hard. Um, but we get the moment where the fifth brother, this is to Cal, but it yeah. applies here is the fifth brother tells Cal, he's like, no, we, I know what happened with second sister. I know why she turned back to the light. Yeah. And it is, it, it is interesting to me that that was shared with him. Cause mm -hmm. I, I feel like if I was on the dark side and the risk of that was acknowledged, I feel like that puts a, a chink in the armor. Yeah. But they were there, right? Fifth brother wasn't. No, I just mean that. Cal was, so it doesn't, doesn't No, but I'm matter. saying that Fifth Brother, Fifth Brother, because uh, Cal is like trying to turn him at first, right? Yeah, And yeah. I think that Fifth Brother acknowledging that the Inquisitors like debriefed what happened with, I would love I think that it's scene, a power play. honestly. Yeah, yeah, The Grand Inquisitor and Vader like talking them through so, how Trilla lost. This is what happened with Trilla. You guys all need to know. Does anyone have any questions? How do we feel about it? Like, <laughs> Will you fill out the survey on the way out? <laughs> let us know how we did. Oh my God. <laughs> Uh, How was your experience with the Empire today? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I want that scene. I feel like I feel like those surveys are inherently evil. 
Just like in life, you know what I mean? Anytime I like get off the phone with someone and they're like, will you fill out this quick survey? And I'm like, I'm yeah, because I want, because sure. I know like, it, I know how much it helps their job. I've been in those jobs before. Yeah. yeah. And then they're like, this is a 36 question survey. And I was like, like, no. Why? What? Why would you do this? I'll answer one question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you did great. It was pleasant. I don't know what you want me to well say. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, Sierra makes a decision here. Mm-hmm. Um, trying desperately not to kill the fifth brother, which ends up with him losing an arm. No, with Grease losing with an arm. With Grease. Sorry, yeah. is, that what it, is that not what I said? <laughs> you said that the fifth brother lost an arm because of this. Yeah, fifth brother lost an arm, dead, done, end of book. Uh, yeah, no, Grease, uh, Grease loses an arm trying to protect Cal. And they, Cal is knocked out. They barely get out of there. They barely So your does use an arc save, though, thankfully. Because, fool. But uh, she'd be a great Inquisitor. I don't, I don't want to see anybody have to go up against her. A fifth brother tells them they'd all be great Inquisitors, you know? I feel like they say that to anyone with the Force, though. They're yeah. like, you know what? You'd be great at this. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot to friends. choose from. You keep killing yeah. my friends, and I need more friends. Yeah. Come, one of us. Reva's so mean to me. <laughs> Fair. And so they get out, and they go where you always go when you lose an arm, right? Um, the spa planet, uh, where you can go hang out in the onsen. <laughs> yeah, the sulfur tubs. I, I want to ask, like, Sam, what her experience in Japan was like. Because she must have gone. Because this is the this was the most Japanese part of the book for me. The onsen, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go have, like, a fully nude emotional conversation in the onsen. Is so reminiscent of my time in Japan. Yeah. Um, I had a full-on... I, I was uh, I was staying at this Ryukin. We were, I was on the road. I worked in Japan um, touring with uh, Disney years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, my boss got into the onsen with me and stood in the onsen. And I'm sitting there... And he starts having this like very serious conversation about the show that we had that night. And I'm like, his junk is right here. And I'm just like desperately trying to keep eye contact with his glasses. Because this man owns the orchestra I'm singing with. Yeah. And I'm sitting there like, mm-hmm. yeah, no, that's, I will, I will do that uh, for tomorrow's show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I was holding the mic to, uh, I'm not going to make that gesture right now. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> no. It was one of the most uh, we, uh, bizarre experiences of my entire life. Mm-hmm. Very sweet man. Loved him. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, we, we do, we fly off to a spa uh, where everyone is very mad at each other and they split up. Yeah, we, this is the part of the book where everyone kind of splinters away from one another. We get that, we, we, it finally comes to a head. Yeah, yeah, it comes to a head where not everyone's on the same page. Um, and, and they don't know how to deal with it. And so they go take 48 hours, basically. Uh, Which... This and this is like the other part of the book that I'm like, I this was a little bit strange to me mm-hmm. because we when we do get to the final fight, the fifth brother shows up and is like, no, we had a tracker on that girl, and I was like, what? Why didn't you go to the spa planet? That, yeah, that was the question that I had. I have no idea. Maybe they just you know it was too far to, out of the way. Yeah, yeah. They're like, we'll wait till they come back into you know one of the closer. Systems. Maybe he was like, maybe he was a little bit more hurt, and he was like, he needed forty hours. He wasn't like letting it on. Yeah, he's he like, went I to need the Imperial Onsen, and him and the Grand Inquisitor had a little bath together, of and they shared a hug like Fret and Marin did. <laughs> uh, uh, I There's hope no, so. Okay. I want that scene. I, I have a question for you. There's no chance Fret and Marin have right. Have ha- Th- together. They're like here. Here's my thing about this book. Uh huh. Fret and Eerie leave together at the end, right? Yeah. Those two are getting back together. They're going to be on the run for like two they, months. They, they say that they're not. They can't tr- no, they can't trust anybody else. They're going to be alone in the galaxy for the next two, uh, two months from now. I'm telling you right now, they're married. Uh, look, I think that they definitely sleep together again, but they are very much on the, both the same page of like, we are different people when we fell in love. We're like, we're, we're not in that place anymore, which is why they invite Marin along, right? They're never going to be able to be honest with anyone ever again. Though they, they are Probably. going to be with the only person they can be honest with for the rest of the empire. Like that, might, that's another, yeah. uh, that's another 16 years. I feel like if Marin went along with it, it'd be so awkward. Just I don't third know. I wheeling like that would the rest be like a life. really interesting polyamorous. Look, if they were if they were a thruple, I think everyone would be happy. But if just Fret and Marin were together, and Irie's like, yeah, so my ex, yeah. The book it's makes cool. it really clear they're all exceptionally hot. Yes, everyone is very sexy. Don't don't worry about it. Everyone is very sexy, except for the fifth brother's hat and, and the, the pink poncho. Hat. Yeah. And even like even Grease is like, no, no, on my planet, guys. I, guys I'm, a, I'm a catch. I'm, I'm the cold. hottest. I wrote the game. 
on Latero. Uh, uh, Grease actually has the, the playbook that Barney Stinson has <laughs> in uh, How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> Have you met Grease? <laughs> Uh, that would so be a fun parody. They, they, they all take their time. Mm -hmm. uh, Seer and Cal have a really great conversation mm -hmm. about uh, their very different viewpoints. Uh, Seer wants to build a legacy for the Jedi, and Cal wants to end the Empire. And it's really and interesting. And Marin wants to murder everybody. Well, yeah, but she's a nice sister. You expect that. Yeah. I, I, I love the disparity between Seer and Cal here because neither of them are right in that neither of them have a path forward, right? Ni neither mm -hmm. of them have a way to accomplish what they want. They both just have yeah. this desire. Yeah. And being pulled apart by desires when you have tangible ways to accomplish things makes sense. Because you can both go your own way and be like, I'm going to do this and you're going to do that. And we both know what we're going to be doing. Yeah. But when you're as close as these two are and you're pulled apart by, I want to do this thing and I don't think I'm going to be able to, like that to me is such an heartbreaking. It's yeah. It it, re it really is. It's heartbreaking, and that's the like the heart in this book. Yes, like Marion and Fred have a spicy relationship. Yeah. But the heart in this book it truly is the the things that are keeping the crew together, mm -hmm. and the things that are pulling them apart, yeah. and how that affects everybody on the ship. Um, because I, I honestly didn't think about it uh, after the first game. It's like, yeah, yeah, they're just bopping around in the mantis doing their thing. But Grease wants to retire one day. You know what I mean? Like he, he with all of his arms, preferably. With, uh, well, that's not gonna happen, unfortunately. Well, three of them. Um, <laughs> whatever your arms are left, right? Like Grease is like, do we have to keep doing this? And Seer wants to create something that is going to outlast all of them. Which, like you said, how do you do that? And Cal wants to fight the Empire and help people who can't help themselves. But how do you do that? And Marin wants to make a dent in the Empire because she can't fight the Separatists. Mm -hmm. But again, how, how do you accomplish those things? And they, they just kind of have to... The, the, the takeaway at the end of this book f from Cal is like, you know what? One piece at a time. One, yeah. one day at a time. And it's very reflective of kind of how we all go through life, right? Mm -hmm. We can't predict for what's going to happen 5, 10, 30 years in the future. We, we we have the here and the now, and we need to make sure that we live in the moment, essentially, and just cherish the relationships that we have with people mm -hmm. and take it a little bit at a time. Because uh, sometimes it's really easy to get lost when you're looking too far ahead because you don't get to see what you're accomplishing right now. And that's what Sears says to Cal. The, the good that we've done... It, it never feels like enough. Like, you're always looking for the next thing. You're not acknowledging all the people that we have helped, that we have saved, the good that we have done in the galaxy. Um, and I think that that's a really, really human, beautiful, relatable moment that, like, ties this entire book together. And really this entire, like, Star Wars arc of, of Cal and the Mantis crew, right? All the way from uh, Fallen Order to probably survivor you know yeah. maybe i'm projecting a little bit but i do think that that is the theme of their story mm -hmm. um and I, I think that it was really well done and it was so beautiful uh we only have a couple minutes left mm -hmm. so i just want to call up final battle quickly uh for it's great i think the final battle is really well written and yeah. pays homage to uh in, in a way that a lot of the action in this game does to the video game elements of um, Jedi Fallen Order. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of jokes about the stim packs and the- Stims, yeah. The stances, the, the force powers. Early in the book, there's a point where Marin is like frustrated about the way Cal gets around the world um, that I thought was a really good joke about the traversal mechanics of the video game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we get the like elevators of bad guys constantly coming, which I feel like is, you know, for gamers is um, everyone's worst nightmare when you're like, oh my God, I'm going to be in this the room elevator, for the next 30 God minutes fighting the same enemy over and over. And over, oh my god, the latest Halo Infinite had the worst. At the end of Halo Infinite is the worst kind of that mission. And then there's this brute chieftain that you have to fight that is like nearly impossible. It doesn't Fifth matter. Brother. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not important. Um, I, God, that game almost broke me. I'm um, so sorry. It's fine. It's going to be okay. It's fine. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so committed to beating every Halo game on Legendary. There, it's, it's, it's just, it's just That's your own fault. Um, <laughs> uh, so we... Um, we get to this final beat where Ire, mm. Irie, I can't get this. Irie, right. yeah, I think. Uh, it's basically like, look, I made a bomb. And because I made a bomb, uh, I, can I make now a know bomb. the shroud <laughs> can never happen. Yeah, she says that the technology is not there, which mm -hmm. is why we don't see this shroud technology in future Star Wars stuff. That was one of the questions in the middle of the book. I was like, oh, oh okay. 
How are they going to get around this like one? like Luke could have used this she's, a couple of times. No, she's too smart. She's too smart. She's way ahead of the technology that they possibly have to make this thing, so don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. I was like, all right. Yeah, it was, it was kind of a, it was a, a little bit too neat of a bow. A little bit. I think it's kind of what you have to do when mm-hmm. the universe is this expansive. Without, like, killing characters. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I don't exactly. think anyone wanted Fretniri to die. That, that no. would have just been sad. Yeah, yeah. That, that would have I think they're showing up in the game. All right, I'm going to say they're not, and you can say that they are. I think we'll Fret will have a shirt it. on, but she will show up in the game. <laughs> uh, I think that's where we're going to leave it, because it is 2 o'clock, and we have mm-hmm. to get ready for the next panel. Thank you so much to everyone, all these live people. Yeah, thank you, thank you guys. Um, <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed the discussion. I hope you laughed a couple of times. That's Mm -hmm. all we're trying to do here. Yeah. And thank you to the country of London for welcoming us. Thank you to Lucasfilm. The country of London. The country of London. Yeah, 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 the the country of London. King Charles himself uh, (laughs) came out uh, and welcomed me personally, which was so kind. Yeah, yeah, it's just really, Uh, really sweet. Uh, Yeah. Thank you to Sam Egg for this incredible book. Yes. Uh, I think that a lot of people really enjoyed it. Um, There's great themes in here, uh, awesome diversity, and it brought Mm -hmm. me a lot of joy. And as uh, to... uh, LGBT content creators getting some stories about LGBT cre- um, creatures. Yeah, creatures. Uh, uh, <laughs> and characters uh, meant a lot to us. Yeah. Uh, and they were so well written. That kind of representation can be hard to find sometimes. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, seeing Disney and Lucasfilm push that uh, is, it, it just, it means a lot to me. I, I, mm-hmm. I was a guy who, I, I didn't come out uh, until I was 26 mm-hmm. um, because growing up in farm country, you know, it <laughs> wasn't going to happen hits you in the way that it hits you. And I think that there's so many times now as the adult that I am, I get these stories and I get these movies and these TV shows. And I think about, I get a little sad about the fact that I'm like, if this had just existed when I was 10, when I was going through middle school, you know what I mean? When I was being bullied, mm-hmm. this would have meant so much to me. Mm-hmm. And I'm so grateful that these stories exist for the kids that are going through those same things that I was going through now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to Lucasfilm and uh, Disney for publishing them and putting them out in the world. Yeah. Uh, with such a big platform. This is a New York Times bestseller. Best bestseller, yeah. Uh, this was number six. Let's go. Uh, on the New York Times bestseller. And so that is just, the, the fact that a story like this can get out there and tell um, a queer story in a way that makes people like me feel included, I think is so important. And I'm yep. so grateful for that. Yeah. Thank you, Star Wars Celebration, for having us. Yeah, Reed Pop, thanks and, for bringing uh, us back for a second year. Hell yeah. And uh, if you want a pin, if you didn't get a pin, yeah, we got pins. Come get one at the front. But thanks, guys, for being here. Follow us on the internet. And I'm at Nerdy Nightly. I'm at Claris Polaris. And as always, <laughs> may the force be with you. Bye, Bye guys. <laughs> Woohoo! Cool.